Hello, and welcome to the Boston Globe Sustainability Week. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank our underwriters for their support. Phillips, our presenting sponsor, as well as the International Business School at Brandeis University and the Museum of Science. On behalf of all of us, we hope you enjoy the program. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation, exploring environmental benefits of digital healthcare tools and other approaches to the greening of healthcare, which is sponsored by Phillips. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of moderating a panel discussion as part of the Boston Globe Sustainability Week, a virtual event series focusing on the climate crisis, current environmental issues, and actionable solutions. I'm thrilled to be with you today. This forward-looking conversation will consider the many benefits of digital health tools, from making healthcare more convenient and controlled for patients and providers, to reducing carbon emissions produced by the healthcare industry. Our panelists will explore the adoption of digital technology to protect the planet while empowering health conscious consumers to take better care of their health and capacity stressed health systems to better address their challenges. Before we get the conversation going, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And before I do that, let me just remind you, this session is being recorded, so you don't have to take copious notes. Anyone who registered will receive a copy of that recording. And as we're talking, please feel free to pop your questions into the Q&A function. And some of you did this ahead of time, so we've got some terrific questions to kick us off, but we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can. So now to introduce our panelists. First, please welcome Robert Metzke. He's head of sustainability as well as chief of staff of innovation and strategy for Philips. Robert is an experienced global program and team leader with passion for innovation, strategy, social impact and change leadership. He plays a key role in formulating and successfully implementing Philips corporate strategy aimed at sustainable development making healthcare accessible and affordable worldwide with energy efficient and circular solutions. Under Mr. Nice Mr. leadership Thanks. and his team continuous efforts, uh, Philips became one of the first technology companies in the world to become carbon neutral in its operation. And, and we're looking forward to hearing from you, Robert. I'd also like to welcome Dr. David Ting, who is Chief Medical Information Officer at Mass General Physicians Organization and co-director of the MGH Center for Innovation in Digital Healthcare. His major initiatives emphasize leveraging technology and workflow engineering to reduce administrative burden on physicians and their practices and improve provider and patient experiences of healthcare. In his leadership role in the Center for Innovation in Digital Healthcare, Dr. Ting brings MGH innovators and investigators together with internal and industry partners to coordinate, guide, and promote ideation, development, implementation, and scaling of next generation digital healthcare solutions. Welcome to you, Dr. Ting. Lastly, I'm also pleased to be joined by Gary Cohen. Gary is co-founder and president of Healthcare Without Harm. Gary has helped, has been a pioneer in the environmental health movement for more than 35 years. He's helped build coalitions and networks globally to address health impacts related to climate change and toxic chemical exposure. He helped create Healthcare Without Harm in 1996 to help transform the healthcare sector to be environmentally sustainable and support the healthcare and climate resilience of the communities they serve. Since its inception, the nonprofit has grown to lead and partner in groundbreaking initiatives in more than 72 countries. A warm welcome to you, uh, Gary Cohen. Um, thanks so much to all of you for being here today and taking part in the Globe Sustainability Week. I should have said at the outset, I'm Ann Kelly. I'm Vice President of Government Relations at Ceres, which is located right here in Boston. And I'm thrilled to jump into this conversation. And I'd like us to start by just establishing a little bit of a baseline when it comes to sustainability and healthcare. And so Robert, I'd like to start with you if I could. Can you tell us what does sustainability mean for your organization? How do you define it at Philips? Yeah, it's a great starter. Thanks, sir. Um, well, we really focus on, on measurable impact through focusing on the sustainable use of energy and sustainable use of materials throughout the entire supply chain. So to make it very practical, uh, if you think about the, our innovation roadmaps or our global operations, for instance, in innovation, 
um, eighty percent of our product environmental impact really is uh, determined by the design phase. So innovation is really crucial. That means we really try to drive eco design and start with the beginning of uh, of, of the product development, basically. Um, so today, already more than seventy percent of our products are eco designed uh, towards 2025 that will be 100% of all new product introductions we have literally invested billions of um, scaling up this eco design program now if you think about operations uh, it's really about producing globally for instance carbon neutrally so we use our own wind farms uh, power purchasing agreements uh, and since 2020 we operate globally carbon neutral and also in the supply chain, and we can talk about it later, we really try to team up with our suppliers to source material in a responsible way. So it's really end to end to try uh, and drive environmental sustainability. And then there's the entire topic of social um, sustainable development, including making healthcare accessible. But I think that's not uh, the core topic of today. Well, thank you, Robert. And I think we're going to have some follow-up questions to that wonderful introduction. But let's move over to you, Dr. Ting, from a physician's perspective. How do you view sustainability at MGH? Thank you, Anne. And I will pile on to, to Robert's wonderful uh, thoughts here in that in healthcare, what our aim is, is to promote and foster human flourishing. And when we think about our planet and our environment and sustainability, it becomes all the more a vital concept because we cannot as uh, as human beings flourish if we don't look for the health of our environment and the health of uh, the sustainability of not just physically what the, the, the plant is around us, but the workflows, the, uh, the interactions between doctor and patient or healthcare clinician and, uh, and the, the person at their home. Uh, so one of the things that we've done a lot at Mass General Brigham over the past two, three years during the course of the pandemic is we've been confronted by and have learned from the need to immediately pivot from an old traditional model of healthcare where it was really patients coming to bricks and mortar clinics to realizing that we need to use our digital health tools to interact with and reach our patients in their homes, in their businesses, remotely, virtually, and, uh, and yet maintain the human connection. Because getting back to the point of flourishing, uh, we, we have to maintain that what makes us human is that connection between uh, the clinician and the patient. Now, how do we do that without uh, creating redundant workflows, creating uh, uh, unnecessary travel, creating unnecessary use of materials, um, creating uh, uh, work streams and material streams where we're wasting personal protective equipment or we're wasting and not reusing uh, medical equipment and so on. Um, and then finally, as, as you mentioned in the, uh, in the intro, one of the things that I've been particularly uh, inspired by and burdened by and, uh, and is the work of the Center for Innovation in Digital Healthcare is to look at the flourishing of the people on the front lines who are providing the healthcare. So we're talking about our doctors, our advanced care practitioners, our NPs, uh, physical therapists, uh, clinicians of, of, uh, of all ranges, because part of sustainability is also asking the question, how do we help them in their work and in their work lives um, to really promote and provide care in a joyful way, in a way that, uh, that as patients, and we're all patients, that we would look forward to interacting with uh, our healthcare providers. Uh, and so th those are some of the thoughts that, that we have around uh, sustainability. Well, I so appreciate that last comment, Dr. Ting. I mean, I think we've all, our hearts have gone out to all healthcare workers these past two years. Uh, my husband is an MD, and I love that you're linking up their well-being and their flourishing with a sense of joy. And if that's something we can bring back to these folks, um, all, all the better. So let's let's hold on that point and, and, and return to it. And Gary, um, Healthcare Without Harm, I'm a huge fan, as you know, aims to transform healthcare so it becomes a, quote, community anchor for sustainability, unquote. Tell us what that looks like. Yeah. So. Um... For one, just to telescope out for a second uh, around sustainability, because it relates to this community level. Um, our analysis is that our reliance on fossil fuels, toxic chemicals, and industrial agriculture as the basis of our civilization is, is 
damaging people's health at, a, at, a, at an epic level and driving the climate crisis. So sustainability in healthcare means to, to detoxify, to decarbonize, to move away from our reliance on fossil fuels and chemicals and industrial agriculture for all of our, all of our delivery systems, for our buildings, for our energy. We've learned that over 70% of the climate footprint is actually in the supply chain and our investments. So we need to really focus on some of the things that Robert talked about in terms of redesigning the stuff that we buy, uh, the MRI machines, the plastics, the IV bags, the food we buy, all of that. And in that context, we are, we are institutions that are in places. Um, we you know, are named after many of the places, Cleveland Clinic, Boston Medical Center. We are embedded in communities. And so being able to leverage our purchasing power to provide more jobs to people and contracts to people in our communities to address racial equity and sustainability, not just for our facilities, but for our communities to leverage our purchasing power, to um, buy more um, racial, from racially diverse farmers and, and, and sustainable growers, partnering with, with school systems, partnering with universities. We need to be anchors to begin to reweave uh, a civilization that actually promotes health, that doesn't uh, externalize harm to the planet or to people, that does not make people expendable. So to me, the, the sustainability journey for healthcare is also embedding uh, justice and health and climate resilience into everything we do, into our supply chain, into our buildings, into our workforce development, into our investments in our communities. And yes, digital health is, is a dimension of, of that larger transformation. Well, thanks so much for putting that um, broad perspective forward, Gary. Um, that's really helpful going forward as we as we zero in a little bit more. But building on what you've just said, uh, we know that globally, the healthcare industry itself contributes 4.4 percent of carbon emissions, and that that number in the U.S. is estimated to be between 8.5 and 10 percent. Robert and Gary, can, can each of you talk about some of the ways your organizations are specifically addressing this issue of carbon emissions? Robert, do you want to go first? Yeah, maybe combining your remark and, and Gary's remark also, I think that makes it also so clear that we need to do something about the enormous environmental impact of healthcare, also for the sheer sake of being able to offer and expand the reach of healthcare. Half of mankind does not have access to healthcare, quality healthcare as we speak today, that's three and a half billion people. If already today, the environmental footprint is about 10% of the national emissions in the United States, for instance, how would we ever want and dare and, and be able to, to expand that? Right. So I think uh, getting a grip on the enormous pollution and the environmental impact of healthcare is also important to not just sustain it at the level that we have, but also being able to make it accessible to others. Maybe to your, to your question, and I think there are a couple of, um, of levers here and rethinking the way how we create products uh, really can help to get a grip on global clean greenhouse gas emissions. So there's this interesting circularity gap report from Circle Economy and also reports uh, from the Adam MacArthur Foundation that really state that about half of the global carbon emissions need to be addressed through different design uh, and avoiding waste. So it's the concept of circular economy. I think that's that's one key enabler, and we can talk about it maybe later. The other one, and closely related to that, is digitalization of care, which I think the, is the core topic of the discussion today also. So digital means that you can um, not just design in a different way, but you can also deliver care in a different way. That starts with early detections, diagnosis, treatment and home care. And the examples that Dr. Um, Ting gave already, I think, allude to this. So digitalization addresses a couple of these things, including eliminating waste throughout the entire healthcare systems with improved workflows, but it all also really can help to shift to more uh, resource efficient ways. For instance, if you think about uh, tax systems or storing data, um, if you move from uh, on-premise to, to cloud storage, you can save up to 93% of, uh, of energy uh, because you can manage uh, these uh, systems at a larger scale. Or think about um, shifting care from really resource intensive clinical settings uh, to network more low cost uh, settings. And, and as Dr. Ting said, going to the homes of people, 
this has so so much impact if you think about the um, the environmental uh, footprint per treatment. So I think that are a couple of um, um, of the most obvious levers, but then uh, two others that I may want to add and then conclude is, uh, of course, dematerialization. So everything that you can provide in terms of uh, solutions to support clinicians and patients that we do not need material, but you can use digital solutions, um, helps to reduce the environmental footprint of the material involved. Um, and then of course, something like equipment utilization. I think that goes closely hand in hand with workforce, workflow optimization, but equipment utilization, expansion of lifetime uh, are critical things where digital, digitalization can help us to uh, reduce the environmental footprint uh, of, um, of healthcare. Thank you. Gary, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I agree with a, a lot of what Robert was saying. Um, some of, um, interesting during COVID, you know, there, there had been many plans from a, a lot of healthcare systems to move toward uh, telehealth um, for their systems. And they had kind of long ramps, three, four or five years where they would move a percentage of, of their uh, patient interactions to, to telehealth. Many of these systems did it within a month because of the COVID epidemic. People didn't want to go into healthcare organizations, into hospitals, because people were dying there and they didn't know, we didn't know how to control things. And so it was very frightening. And so we know of several systems that have both moved within a month to telehealth and also documented the climate carbon savings of doing so. Um, so that's just, in, it's an interesting that COVID was a force multiplier and sort of a, uh, a speeding up of, of this entire process. Um, what we're doing with, with hospital systems around the country and with the federal government um, is to accelerate all this movement. So we've taken a, you know, a page from Ceres where you have this group of very leading systems called BICEP of leading uh, corporations that were showing the way toward a kind of zero emissions, climate smart business model. And we've done the same thing in healthcare. We've created a healthcare climate council in the United States of which Mass General is, is, is a part um, of 19 systems that are all making dramatic commitments around carbon neutrality, around the race to zero, zero emissions, aligning now with the federal government and then, and then aggregating their power together. So we convene them to say, okay, where is the hot spots in the supply chain, in our buildings, in our energy, in our food? And how can we design standards to then go to the supply chain and say, here's the innovation we need. Some anesthetic gases are 2000 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Let's phase them out and, and move towards safer alternatives. Um, how do we move away from some of the incredible amount of, as you mentioned, and throw away plastics, single use devices? How do we reprocess more stuff? How do we move toward bio-based plastics that don't require petrochemicals to, to make them. Um, so that momentum is, is, is happening. And there is now an Office of Climate Change and Health Equity at the Department of Health and Human Services that has prioritized decarbonizing the healthcare system in the United States and making it more resilient uh, to the extreme weather events and, and conditions that we're seeing happening all around the world. So it's, it's not just about decarbonizing healthcare, it's also about addressing the health inequities that we see so searingly um, clear through the, the COVID epidemic is that we need to ad address the health inequities as we're decarbonizing. That's a crucial dimension. And there are solutions that do those things together. So that's some of what we're doing. And we've created roadmaps in terms of pathways to decarbonize. We've created tools to measure and then there's this peer-to-peer -peer learning so that we can accelerate progress across the entire sector. Well, thanks so much for providing that crucial linkage there at the end, linking reducing health inequities as we reduce carbon emissions. And I think the entire movement is looking at reducing inequity and environmental inequity as we reduce carbon emissions and, and healthcare is no different. Dr. Ting, I'd love to just take some time and hear from your perspective, working for a large integrated health system, we know you implemented one of the first practice-wide electronic medical records in a mass general health center, pioneering the emerging technologies of the time. Tell us about that initiative and what the results have been, both from relieving the administrative burden and also the environmental benefits, if you would. 
Absolutely, Anne. And, and this builds on some of the things that Robert and Gary are, are both speaking about. Um, and so it's really the story of information around our patients. So you might call it the, the data journey. And, uh, and it's also the story of how um, governmental regulation actually works hand in hand potentially uh, with healthcare to move things forward. G Gary used the word accelerant. And I think we're really at a point right now where we're seeing with the pandemic, another tipping point. But to your point, Anne, about how electronic health records have, have just revolutionized healthcare, I would say over the past 15 years or so, um, one of the things that's just revolutionized healthcare is the democratization of patient data. So if we all think back just to the, the early 2000s, um, your information as a patient basically sat in your doctor's office as a paper file. And that wasn't very portable. And in fact, if you went to a different doctor or a specialist, a, 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 a urgent care center in, in your community, those clinicians would have no idea what your primary doctor had been working with you on. But because of the original uh, recession that was going on in 2008, 2009, and if you all remember, the federal government stepped in with the stimulus package. Part of that stimulus in the uh, American Recovery Act um, was to incentivize hospitals, healthcare delivery systems, and physicians to adopt and meaningfully use electronic systems. Now, that was meant to stimulate the, 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 the healthcare industry, but the real underlying genius was to create an incentive and policies around bringing doctors, hospitals, healthcare workers into using common electronic language. So now suddenly that chart that used to be on paper is now electrons. And those electrons can be passed between your doctor, your specialists, uh, urgent care centers, and, and so on. So that's part of the journey. But now over the past decade, um, healthcare, just as you see in, in, in comparing to many other industries, tends to be extremely conservative. And that makes sense because we don't want to kill people. But in the conservatism around change, healthcare continually lags, right? And so whereas the banking industry, like Philips, the, 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 the technical industry, imaging industries, they've, they've zoomed ahead in terms of application technology. In healthcare, we've had the capability to provide telemedicine and virtual care, but the uptake has been like that. And so because of it, we haven't been able to fortify that path where you capture data and then the data are curated and stored. And Robert talked about through cloud storage, for instance. And then the data are computed on. Today, we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Well, you need data in order to fortify the machine learning. And then you, you surface insights that's presenting it to your clinicians on the screen or in reports. And then there's executing or acting on the data. And that's where we start to get into the health equities and, and healthcare democratization issues. Because gosh, if you only execute and act on the data with people who have access to the internet or people who have access to uh, high-end computing devices or very expensive uh, mobile devices, well, now you're only reaching a part of the population and what happens to the have-nots? And now all of that journey has been slowly chugging away because there really hasn't been the incentive to seriously think about how are we gonna move from the old style of healthcare, which is a centralized bricks and mortar based healthcare where patients come to the, the, the big medical centers to the new way that we have to be thinking about healthcare in a sustainable world where it's geographic distribution of healthcare, where you bring the providers closer to where the patients actually live, where you can reduce the commute that patients have to go through, the time wasted, the redundancies of services and so on. Well, just as, as our other panelists have been talking about, you need that movement toward digitization and providing the digitization to all of our population, not just the, the technical haves, right? And so along comes COVID. And now as Malcolm Gladwell would describe tipping point, now here comes a huge tipping point because suddenly 
we can't come to the big medical center. Suddenly, we couldn't leave our homes. And thanks to openness in our Massachusetts state uh, uh, policies, as well as federal policies, now we suddenly allowed clinicians to have face-to-face -face contact over video links, right? And so we started adopting Zoom, Teams, other secure means of, uh, of communicating with our, uh, our patients. At the Mass General Hospital, this exact time two years ago, we saw a decrease in our in-person patient volume by 89%. At the same time, we saw an increase in the use of telemedicine and particularly video telemedicine by 8,000%. And so what we were unable to do for decades because there just wasn't the social incentive to do it, suddenly we saw an 8,000% rise. And over the next two years, there were many of our practices that continued 85, now down to 65% virtual visits. Even today, our behavioral health specialists, this is our psychologists, psychiatrists, 90% of them are still doing their work with patients by video link. And, and we can talk about that because that starts to ask the question, well, what does this mean for the patient doctor uh, relationship, right? Now, back to the rest of our operations, at our institution, we're back down to less than 25%, maybe 25, maybe 15% uh, video visits. And we might have a conversation about why is that? Well, part of it is changes or reversions of regulations back to um, the payment models and, and, and different structures that incentivize whether or not you see a patient in person versus uh, uh, virtually. But then there is the question of, our patients themselves, I'm a primary care patient in medicine and pediatrics. Many of my, of my patients, if not most, say, you know, they just wanna come back and have a face-to-face -face with me in the exam room. And so, so there are these cultural things going on, right? Now, in that milieu, we've over the past two years developed some really neat technology and Philips and, and other, uh, others in the market have really capitalized on this moment in time to develop remote patient monitoring tools, to develop better and more secure video links that are easier for patients to access. Uh, we've developed better patient portals. This is all the health systems in our, uh, our, our Boston area. And so there is this potential for us to really make it real, the idea of healthcare at home, the idea of home hospital, the idea of early discharges from, uh, from the medical center to the home and, and sometimes directly to the home, bypassing rehab, bypassing um, you know, kind of the interim steps because we now have the ability to monitor vital signs and, and more than that, to, to interact with patients remotely, uh, to gather their data. And that feeds back into this whole um, journey of data story where the more information we can collect from wearable devices, from remote patient monitoring and so on, the more we can feed machine learning and artificial intelligence and advance the way that we take care of patients. So it's, it's really an exciting time. And, and I feel uh, torn about this exciting time is born out of a time of intensive suffering, uh, intensive challenge um, to, to all of the globe's readers, to, to our, our, our entire world. But, um, but sometimes, as we know, it takes these massive tipping points to create opportunities. And, and I know Gary and Robert and, and others are really working and thinking hard about how do we you know, use this moment in time. Well, thank you, Dr. Tang. That's a really thorough answer. And you addressed a number of issues, including some that have already come up from our listeners in the q and I want to bring us back to carbon emissions, if I could. And can you talk a little bit about how considerations about carbon emissions and emission reduction factor into your research and projects at the MGH Center for Innovation and Digital Healthcare? Yes. So, you know, in terms of what can we do to, to reduce waste, for instance, and what can we do to, um, to, to actually uh, uh, augment that, that circular, circular economy, as, uh, as Robert talked about? Well, some of the things that we can do is start to apply uh, artificial intelligence and workflow engineering to optimize our current, um, our current technology base and, uh, and physical plant base. And, and here, here's what I mean by that. 
it's going to take years, if not decades, for us to really transition from traditional health care's model to that distributed model that I talked about. And so in the meantime, we've still got 200-year-old buildings that we need to manage. And many of them are built on old energy systems. They're built on old waste, uh, waste cycle systems and, and so on. There's also the difference now in the movement of patients through our clinics where, you know, you, you enter in virtual care. Um, now you have a whole different mix of what type of patients are coming through and when are they coming through? Well, it turns out that because we have much better monitoring of flows through our buildings, even in the traditional bricks and mortar health systems, we can now look at physician schedules as a, for instance, and optimize when should doctor's offices be open? When should they make uh, schedules available for patients to, uh, to interact with? And how about doing more uh, self-service, providing patients, just like with the airlines and, and movie uh, theaters, allow patients the opportunity to schedule themselves at times that are convenient to them. So what does this end up doing? It ends up maximizing the use of the available space so that we're not you know, having people waiting in their cars or, and, and waiting in traffic. You actually uh, schedule people in a way that they come in, they're seeing right away. Like that's the, that's the, uh, the, the potential benefit. Then on the, the waste side, by, re, by making more efficient the workflow through the hospitals, we reduce the reliance on, um, on single use personal protective equipment as a, as a for instance, and other single use um, implements that, um, that to me, it's just heartbreaking how you open up a package, you use a device once, and it seems like 90% of the space is plastic waste and packaging and, and, and so on. Um, now, in terms of the existing buildings, there is an opportunity, again, thanks to the foresight of, uh, of the Boston Planning Board and so on, to allow us to replace some of our older physical buildings with newer structures that are LEED certified, that are uh, zero carbon emission buildings uh, and, and much more energy efficient. Plus, as I think our, our other panels have, uh, have spoken to making contracts to, to ensure that the energy that the, um, that the hospitals are using is renewable energy and, uh, and is connected with, uh, with cap and trade and, and programs uh, such as that. And so for the Center for Innovation in Digital Health itself, um, we are very intentional in partnering with industry leaders in, in bringing in pilot programs, bringing in uh, controlled trials of new technologies in remote monitoring, in AI, um, and in uh, and, and workflow engineering to solve some of these problems that we're talking about. For sure. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about um, partnerships and collaboration. I mean, it's clear that the greening of healthcare is going to require partnerships and, and collaboration of various sorts. And Robert, I'm wondering if you can speak to the ways in which Philips is collaborating with both governments and other organizations and NGOs. Yeah, happy to give some examples. I think that's indeed uh, key. Uh, many of the topic um, problems that uh, that Gary and, and Dr. Ting spoke about are obviously to to pick for any single player, be it an NGO or a hospital or a payer or the government to address. Right. So we need find uh, to find ways to to team up uh, and develop roadmaps, uh, have a common dot on the horizon. Uh, you may recall that the World Health Organization said that the Paris Climate Treaty is the most important healthcare or not. Yeah, it's the most important healthcare treaty of the 21st century, right? Because of this interlinkage between uh, climate um, and, and healthcare. So some of the things that we do, teaming up with uh, innovation partners uh, like customers, but also industry partners and NGOs, giving you an example, a couple of years back, we launched together with the uh, World Resource Institute, the World Economic Forum, uh, some governments, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a, a platform to accelerate the circular economy pace. So if you would want to look it up, uh, you need to uh, Google for Pace Circular. Uh, that is really a platform where all these uh, different elements, uh, public, private, government, come together and uh, exchange best practices, very practical things to really uh, advance um, ideas around how to, how to become more circular. Uh, other ideas are teaming up with like-minded organizations on how to source renewable energy um, and building these power purchasing agreements. That's also something that we bring to our suppliers, helping them to reduce their carbon emissions. Uh, so we want to have 
at least half of our suppliers on science-based targets in the next uh, in the next five years. Then, of course, teaming up with customers, really having our research folks in the hospitals uh, working hand to, uh, hand in hand together with the uh, the clinicians to really understand uh, what's uh, what's happening there and how to best support them. Uh, and as I said, uh, in the supply chain, <coughs> um, sharing the capabilities and experience that we have built up on our own operations um, and building these capabilities also upstream. Um, yeah, let me stop there. There's a lot uh, happening and teaming up is essential. Absolutely. I think raising the circular economy, we'll return to that. Gary, how does healthcare without harm work with various strategic partners around the world? Can you tell us? Yeah, um, there's so many different levels of partnership. I mean, we've always seen ourselves as kind of being an Intel chip inside of healthcare. Instead of building a big organization, we think it's crucial to build innovation and a movement inside a, a, of the healthcare sector for sustainability, uh, for health equity, for climate smart strategies. So it's all about partnership. Um, so I'll give you a few examples. Um, one is that we've teamed up with the National Academy of Medicine, who's convened this incredibly large table of all the players in the country, suppliers, uh, Joint Commission, um, American Hospital Association, health professional organizations to all come together around uh, the decarbonization of healthcare. So coming up with agreed upon metrics, agreed upon reporting requirements, um, identifying for the federal government, what are the barriers that are preventing healthcare from doing this? Some of the things that, uh, that Dr. Ting says is like, getting the right incentive structure and the financing right to actually support this work. Because the greenest hospital is the one we don't build. It's moving away from that as, as sort of the central focus of healthcare. And in fact, moving upstream to address the conditions that are making people sick in the first place. Um, so that is an enormous um, uh, initiative that has the uh, Assistant Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Uh, Rachel Levine as a co-chair. So it's actually helping to inform what the government is going to do in terms of incentives and regulation and joint commission, et cetera. That's a big one. Uh, another one that we're doing is with the United Nations Development Program, where we've uh, joined together to develop globally validated purchasing standards, low carbon toxic free standards that could then cascade into health ministries, into health systems who are saying, okay, if you're making a commitment to uh, zero emissions, what do I need to buy? What are the, the, the technologies that I need to buy? What are the products? What are the companies that are actually innovating on this space and identifying those for buyers so that we can start um, incentivizing, we can start rewarding companies like Philips that are, that are making these innovations possible. There's no way to decarbonize the healthcare system unless the supply chain companies are partners. Because if so much, if 75% of the, of the carbon footprint is in the supply chain, the suppliers have to be completely in lockstep with the, the healthcare providers and the insurers to move the entire sector forward. I mean, in the United States, it's almost 20% of the economy. The only thing that's bigger is the military. So if we can show, by example, how do we move toward detoxing, decarbonizing the healthcare system, dematerializing it, moving more healthcare to the community level so that the hospital is the place of last resort or where you need some you know, intensive intervention, that will be fundamental um, because we need to model that for, for the rest of society. All the companies that Siri is working with, they need to join in that effort as well. So those are a couple of the partnerships. No, you're exactly right, Gary, and we're all in this, and I appreciate you commenting on other broader aspects of the economy um, in this together and detoxifying healthcare. That's a great phrase. Robert, let's and build if, uh, on- if, if I may, because you had asked about partnership, and, and I noticed that there are a few uh, questions in the, um, in the chat room um, uh, about partnering specifically around uh, reuse of medical equipment and so on, and I think that touches on what Gary and Robert are, are both talking about. So a real example of this that came out of COVID is that the Mass General Brigham uh, COVID Center for Innovation um, uh, partnered with Battelle and, uh, and Steris, who are our uh, medical equipment um, suppliers, 
uh, to recognize that we were burning through N95 masks, uh, particularly in the early days of, of COVID, to the point where we were starting to worry that we weren't going to have enough for our, um, our clinicians to use. And so what Battelle helped us do is test many different ways to decontaminate and reuse uh, existing N95s, including things like irradiating them and heating them up, microwaving them. Interestingly, we found that most of the ways of decontaminating masks actually destroyed the material, um, except for the use of hydrogen peroxide vapor. And so they created um, a, a, a giant containerized uh, process that they parked outside of Assembly Row, and some of you may have uh, seen them as you drove by um, uh, that facility, where we would send every day thousands of N95 masks uh, to be decontaminated and, uh, and reused. Uh, so that was a big success story. Um, now, the, the today reality is we've gone back to using single-use N95, but with a different twist, because we've also discovered in a workflow fashion that you can actually re-wear N95 masks. And so that started to get over the, the cultural um, uh, taboo within healthcare that, gee, you know, you, you don't want to reuse your mask. Well, actually, if you're a single person, you're using your own mask, you can reuse it all day long. And, and so in that case, we could bypass going through the whole transportation chain of moving masks over to the, the decontamination processing center and then having them resent back, you know, because that in itself is a waste of energy. Um, and so, uh, so it, it showed, you know, the, a story of partnership with industry, but also kind of real time learning and iterating on, on the best ways to, uh, to be good stewards of the, the materials we have. Yeah, absolutely. That's a terrific example and just so timely, um, Dr. Ting. We're about to go to more of the questions that are in the chat and some of the pre-questions that were asked, but Robert, I, I sensed you you might have wanted to say a little bit more about the circular, circular economy, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to do that in relationship to Philip's initiatives. Yeah, thanks, Kelly, uh, uh, and uh, apologies. And I think that this building exactly also on the examples that uh, Dr. Ting was giving. What I like about the examples of uh, of Dr. Ting is that it illustrates it's not just technology; it's also behavior, right? It's us. It's not technology is not going to fix it for us, and that's why I think what Gary is trying to do with what you are actually doing with building these communities um, is such a big uh, uh, element of of driving these transitions. Now, um, indeed, uh, we are quite passionate about circular economy and. Uh, you could wonder why, but uh, as said in the beginning, half of the emission reductions really need to come from these circular models. If you translate it to the healthcare industry, um, from a Philips perspective, 80% of our environmental impact is in the use phase. And a lot of that environmental impact is embedded carbon. Think about these uh, big imaging equipment, for instance, uh, MR scanners or so, these uh, magnets, how much energy it takes to extract these materials from Earth, uh, assemble these, uh, mold them, ship them around, install them. So there's a lot of energy in there. So one of the things that you can do, obviously, is expanding the life cycle of these by, for instance, thinking about um, modular design so that you can exchange components, uh, like in your smartphone. Uh, throwing away a smartphone every time a new camera comes out is pretty stupid, but it's what it's market market practice, right? Uh, we try to move away from that in a hospital setting by saying, okay, if we have a better detector or right or a specific electronic component, if you design them in a way, then you can leave, for instance, the big magnet in place. So modular design is an important part. Being smarter about material choices. So what material to use and what not to use so that you can recycle uh, and refurbish in, in a better way. Then, of course, refurbishing the machines themselves so we really invested in uh, refurbishment cap capabilities and we were able to take back basically all large scale medical equipment in any market around the world by now uh, because we have built these capabilities. Um, and then bring these uh, with effectively warranties, uh, full warranties back into the market at an interesting price point for the customer also. So that's also a way of extending life cycle and reducing the uh, enormous amount of uh, um, of energy that goes into creating these new materials um there are <clears throat> there are more examples of course uh, but um, um yeah maybe the last ones uh, that i could mention is digitalization we spoke about it earlier right so providing functionality uh, without employing huge amounts of materials and all that goes back again to also different ways of interacting with customers uh, uh, dr ting and gary spoke about um 
the engagement and what it means from pra practitioners and, and, and care providers to behave in a different way. But it's also, for instance, payment models uh, and business systems. So rather than selling equipment, um, moving to partnerships where you lease equipment or offer, for instance, imaging or patient monitoring as a service are different ways of uh, engaging and keeping ownership over the material flows, managing them in a better way and reducing the environmental footprint. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to jump into some of these terrific questions that some of our listeners submitted ahead of time. And I'm, I'm doing my best to uh, kind of summarize some of the big themes. And Gary, I'm going to start this one with you. The topic is waste. We've talked about healthcare waste for a very, very long time. I went to the Clean Med Conference you invited me to once. And I remember, I think it was Dartmouth Hitchcock had recycled hospital gowns into bedpans and everyone was wearing them on their heads. And I thought, wow, that's a great way to deal with waste. Um, the specific question, I, I know you've given waste a lot of thought and look forward to your answer. The question is, are there digital systems for managing healthcare waste? Is there any tool for managing healthcare waste data? You know, are there devices and software installed that can uh, offer some new alternative treatments for healthcare waste? Uh, would love to hear about any innovation yeah. on that from you, Gary, and then to others. Yeah, so um, we have a, a division of, of the organization in the United States called Practice Green Health, which has about 1400 hospitals that are kind of members, partners. And so we've developed a tool that allows them to easily capture their waste to sort of uh, manage the segregation of it, to identify the different components of it, and then to show what they can reprocess, what they can recycle over time. We're not the only people that have that. There's a, a company called uh, Key Green Solutions that also does that. So it's actually a place, waste is often the place where healthcare institutions that are trying to get into sustainability um, sort of kind of enter into, they enter into the waste because it's a place where you can save an enormous amount of money also. Um, so we've been talking about, um, uh, Dr. Tim was talking about all the stuff that gets thrown away when you open up a, a kid in a surgery. There's so many different devices that could actually be reprocessed. And so what, what that means is that instead of throwing away that device, you send it to a facility and it gets re-sterilized and it gets sold back to you. It gets sold back to you at 50% off. So it makes so much sense to increase the number of devices that can be uh, reprocessed. How is that going to happen? It's not going to happen just because the manufacturers are doing it because they're still incentivized to produce single-use devices. It's going to happen when we create the aggregated demand of all the major hospitals in the country to then demand that of the suppliers. Uh, and then that will increase. That's been our experience all along. It's been, there are certainly companies uh, like, like Philips that are just so far ahead in their thinking about circularity and climate. And there's many, many, many that are still incentivized to have a linear model of continuing to produce a lot of waste, single use devices. There's so many different technologies and we have to change that mindset. We have to create a, a kind of a longer time horizon so that we're actually designing not for today only, but for our grandchildren. Because what we know about the climate crisis is that no one will be immune. There is no vaccine against the climate crisis. And already the World Health Organization is saying that nine out of 10 people on earth are breathing air that is not healthy for them. UNICEF is saying a billion children on the planet, this is half all the kids in the world, are actually at risk in some way from climate crisis. So, at a certain point, we have to embed these values about what does it mean to do no harm? We're the one sector that lives with that ethical framework. We've got to model what that means in everything we do. I don't know who, it's not healthcare, I don't know who's gonna do it. Well said, I think that is a tweetable quote Gary just gave us. So I hope you're all live tweeting and reminding uh, all of us, the sector has the Hippocratic Oath. Robert, Dr. Ting, any thoughts to build on, on the digital tools associated with waste potentially? Um, maybe very briefly from my side. Um, so building on what Gary said and adding to it, I think it has also something to do with mindset. Um, and um, um, a wiser person than me said once, uh, there is no waste, there are just resources at the wrong place, mm -hmm. uh, right? So I think that's also something to consider. Um, I think a lot in, in healthcare is codified um, in uh, protocols um, and procedures and so forth. So it is also about 
Uh, I mean, there's, of course, there's procurement, uh, and Gary, you spoke about it. So uh, thinking about, as a care provider, how you want to procure in a sustainable way, what you want to procure is important, but also thinking about uh, and teaming up around uh, adjusting these care protocols in a way that allow basically to reuse, uh, for instance, refurbished uh, equipment also is a very important element of that. And that, again, are cultural changes. So I think it is also has something to do with how, how we look at materials. Are we, uh, are we seeing the waste? Are we seeing what we are doing? Um, it, if we look at these 13 kilograms of waste per, per, per bed uh, uh, per day in a hospital, right? Uh, are we seeing that or is somebody else taking that away for us uh, and keeping our operating field clear so that we can focus uh, on, on the patient? Mm -hmm. I think that that is a little bit the, the balance, but I see increasingly more care providers really thinking about it. And as I think both uh, Gary and Dr. Ping said in the beginning, you cannot save patients if you destroy the planet at the same time. So I see a convergence uh, that makes me hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, the other big theme I want to touch on when the time that we have is the patient clinician interaction, the value of face to face interaction. Can any of you speak to that in the context of this conversation about about digital health care and, and how do you balance the, the maintaining of that personal relationship with the need to increase technology in medicine? And I, I really appreciate that that question. And I'll jump in as a as a practicing primary care doctor to say that that I've experienced firsthand that this is a, a two-edged sword, the, the virtualization and digitization of healthcare, where if we look at it from a health equities perspective and a and a democratization of healthcare, um, there have been tremendous strides made because now virtual care is part of our healthcare culture where people who used to have trouble accessing healthcare now can access it. And, and I've talked about my patients who uh, have mobility problems or because of their age um, have, have transportation issues, aren't able to um, come to doctor's visits un unless a family member takes time off work to drive them in. Well, with virtual care and telemedicine, now those patients can see me regularly and I believe they're getting uh, better healthcare because they're having better access to healthcare. Uh, I mentioned previously in behavioral health, where everyone would be right to assume, well, that's all about relationship, right? And we were really worried. Now, how can you have a therapy session um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a video um, uh, platform? Well, as it turns out, patients by and large, and, and our numbers show 90% of our patients prefer to have the virtual therapy session because it's so convenient. You don't have to spend an hour driving down I-93 to, to, to get to your therapist's office. Now you turn on your camera and you have a face-to-face. -face. As long as you're assured of the privacy and security of that link, um, it's actually just as good, maybe better, than, um, than having to walk into a doctor's office physically and have that, um, that visit. And so for the behavioral health community, both on the provider and patient side, um, virtual care has really opened up the door to access for patients um, in a way that we haven't had before. And so, um, and so in, in those ways, virtual care has been a real plus, but there's the other side of the double-edged sword where um, there are many patients who, who miss just being touched. And, um, and still in my clinic, I'll, I'll be honest, because COVID is still a thing and the pandemic is, you know, even though it's winding down, there's, there's still concern over the, um, uh, the safety and health of both our staff and our uh, clinicians, as well as the patients themselves. There's still a lot of gloving, a lot of gowning, a lot of masking, um, and even the act of seeing your clinician where the whole time both parties are, are masked up, yeah, that, that does interfere a bit with the, um, with the communication and the, the body language and so on. And ironically, it's actually easier sometimes to have your visit over Zoom or Teams than to have you know, everyone masked up. Um, and so, uh, so you're right, and, uh, and, and for all the, 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 the participants who've asked the question about the relationship, it's complicated and it, it changes healthcare in many of the same ways that it's changed our society writ large and, and, and the whole controversy over masks or no masks and, and so on. 
And it's adding new opportunities also, right? I mean, um, uh, you already said, uh, you gave a couple of examples, Dr. Ting, but also underserved communities or rural um, uh, communities uh, where you have long travel times. Or if you think about maybe outside the United States, um, um, going to, to, to Africa or uh, whatever, um, where sometimes you can have relatively lower trained health professionals that are doing, for instance, uh, ultrasound uh, scans of, of pregnant women, um, if they have a telehealth connection, they could, uh, for instance, be supported or assisted um, from, from a second line um, practitioner, they get a second opinion. In, so there are a lot of things that are possible, but as said earlier, technology is not gonna, gonna solve it uh, for us. I think it's the ethics around it, how we wanna use the technology um, to, to the best uh, interest of, of the patient also. And I, I, would add that also, that I would add that it's also about um, empathy. And so uh, the empathy of a, of a clinician with the patient is, is so profound. Um, I know there's been studies where if a clinician just sits next to the patient in the patient room and just is totally present for five minutes, the patient will say, my God, they spent so much time with me because they were present. They were there with them. They weren't looking at this. They weren't writing stuff up. They weren't. They were just there. And so whether it's on a Zoom call or in a, in a facility or a clinic, um, empathy is one of the most important skill sets that clinicians need to bring to that relationship. Gary, can I pile on to, to what you just said, which is so beautiful, because uh, this gets to something that I would, I would hope our viewers uh, take, take thought about, which is part of sustainability is the human cost of delivering care on the provider side. And so as we produce more platforms for telemedicine and more digital tools, apps, you know, when, when patients come to us and they've got information on five different apps on their phone, or they've got their Fitbit, Apple Watch, Samsung gear, whatever it is, all these wearable devices, and they come to the, the doctor's office, um, just think of the cognitive load on our clinicians to have to now absorb all of these systems. And, um, and it's creating a kind of a administrative burden that is burning out our clinicians. So over the past years, no, numerous studies have revealed that anywhere from 35 to 65% of doctors in this country are burned out. And if we lose them, that's a big loss to society. And, and so it gets to the human sustainability equation. And so what's my, my call to action is for technology companies, for vendors, for industry leaders to think about uh, platforms of interoperability where rather than 15 different systems where we have to go to get data, should we start to agree on different data standards or different data sharing standards where whether it's a Philips device or a GE device or, or, or other sort of uh, technologies, the data flow in in a similar way so that there's just one point of, of information that clinicians need to absorb. Um, and this also feeds into now if we have standards about how information is collected from all these devices and apps, now we can train the next generation of what we call clinical decision support, CDS, which is a, a kind of an artificial intelligence that informs clinicians about what are the best practices and best decisions and, and so on to help them in the patient care. Now, if we could kind of reduce that cognitive burden in that way, we can make, make things so much more sustainable in terms of accessibility to our patients. Yeah, absolutely. In our final 60 seconds, quick question for all three of you is this, given telehealth and digitization, will we solve two problems that are looming, which is will, will, they, will telehealth have an impact on either improved patient outcomes and or reining in the cost uh, of healthcare writ large? Quick thoughts on either of those. Gary? Both, both. it will both. do both. And also it, it, it will help to internalize also the thinking around uh, what climate smart healthcare looks like. So will be much more discriminating about what, when's, when's the right time for an in-person interfa interface and when is it good to be on Zoom with various you know, uh, devices that can monitor patients at home, et cetera, et cetera. So for sure. Okay, Robert. I agree. Yeah, big enabler, uh, definitely helpful. It's not gonna 
happen by itself. I think we need this uh, level of uh, awareness and compassion that uh, that Gary and, and uh, Dr. Ting have been speaking about, uh, understanding um, that we are living in a system, right, and that we need to not just uh, protect the patients, but also, also the earth. And then these data applications can help to make the right decisions for the patient and for the environment. For sure. And, that's and I, I would agree with my colleagues that the, the potential has been proven uh, and, and shown and the potential is there, but just like climate change and sustainability writ large, it comes down to as a society, will we prioritize funding these things and, uh, and, and work to, to change the regulations in a way that safely makes it possible to offer these solutions? Because uh, we risk going backwards and, and we risk, you know, as the pandemic ends, we risk going back to the pre-pandemic ways. Well, you're exactly right. And I wish we had another hour to take on the policy and regulatory issues inherent in this discussion. But let me just thank uh, all of you for this conversation. It was robust. And let me uh, thank all of our listeners for joining us again. You'll receive a recording of today's session. And I hope that you have an active and engaged Earth Week, all of you, uh, that recommits you and all of us to addressing climate change in healthcare and in other sectors. Thanks so much to all of you. Thank you, David, Thanks, Robert, Gary. Thanks so much.